J. Krishnamurti, Talk New York City, Saturday, April 14th, 1984. Clapping. Shall we wait a few minutes till the people sit down? Maybe we'll begin now. If one may point out, this is not an entertainment. This is not to help stimulation, but rather this is a serious gathering. And we are not doing any kind of propaganda or try to convince you of anything. New ideologies, new philosophy, new kind of esoteric nonsense. We are serious and it is important that we together think and observe together and perhaps also listen together, not only to what the speaker is saying, but also to all the things that are happening in the world, the terrible things that are happening, the confusion, the chaos politically, economically, and of course religiously, it's just a matter of entertainment, stimulation, based on belief and dogmas and faith and vast network of superstition. And there is always the threat of war. So we ought to be able together to observe this extraordinary phenomenon that is taking place at the present time. Thinking together is very important. Because we never meet either intellectually at the same level, at the same time, or meet, think together, holistically, together. We are so individualistic in our opinions, in our conclusions, in our beliefs and dogmas and so on, which prevent us from really thinking together. I do not know if you have noticed, very few people think together. putting aside our particular idiosyncrasies, particular reactions, and, idiosync and any form of 
repetitive reactions. If we could, this morning at least, for an hour or so, put aside our particular dogmatic, assertive, aggressive conclusions, then perhaps we could think together. We're not trying to convince you of anything. Please believe it. We're not trying to force you, point out, or even try to help you. But rather, if we could actually think together, it would be a marvellous thing if we could. Very few people have succeeded. Either we disagree or agree. This is not required, either agreement or disagreement, where we are thinking together. Thinking, actually thinking together, not being instructed about what to think, or guided, which is the function of a lecture. A lecture is intended to inform and to instruct. But this is so, this is not that kind of affair. We could think together, listen together, and perhaps learn together. of what is actually, first, what is happening in the world, who are responsible for all the mess, the confusion and the misery, and the terrible things that are happening, and what is the responsibility of those who observe, not merely intellectually, verbally, but observe with their whole being, with their mind and their heart, observe, feel, understand, and act. What is our responsibility? Are we Americans looking at the whole world? British, French, German, Russian, with their nationalistic divisions, tribal glorification, which is nationalism, or are we looking at this whole phenomenon as human beings first? not as a scientist, or a philosopher, or a psychologist, and so on, as a Catholic, Protestant, Hindu, Buddhist, and all that business, but as human beings. Looking at this extraordinary world which human beings have created. Could we do that this morning? Forget your particular nationalistic, patriotic nonsense, or religious conclusions with certain faith, dogma and belief not be anchored at all to any of this. To look at the world which we have created 
so freely, so intensely, and perhaps passionately. So that we are together. Not the speaker is saying something to which you agree or disagree, but together. See what is happening. As one travels around the world, meeting so many people with all their different characteristics, with their superstitions and beliefs and dogmas and so on, one wonders why human beings who have lived on this earth, according to the archaeologists and so on, for 45,000 years, and more. Why, during all the duration of time, we remain what we are? Though technologically we have advanced tremendously, but externally we have extended the capacity of the brain. Which requires tremendous energy to build all the instruments of war. All the beneficial effects apart from war help man to live more comfortably, more healthily, and so on. But when we look at ourselves after 45,000 or 50,000 years, great evolution, not only biologically, externally, why is it that we are what we are now? Worship tribalism, which is called nationalism, frightened, insecure, killing each other in the name of God, in the name of peace, in the name of some ideologies, aggressive, brutal, violent, suspicious, and utterly insecure, carrying a great burden of sorrow. This is what we are now. And starvation of which you know nothing about in this country. Perhaps those who are poor have certain social security, but you go to the East, there is no social security. Population is multiplying every year in India about 15 million people. Poverty is extensive. Violence is spreading more and more. The world is becoming dangerous. And looking at all this, and probably you also look and listen from the newspapers and magazines, news broadcasts and so on. What is our responsibility? 
What shall we do together? Not one individual. Or try to gather those people of the same perception and form an institution, an organization. And we have had tremendous, great many institutions. Great many people will tell us what to do. Leaders, political, religious, and so on. We have had them all by the thousands. And yet we remain what we are. This is a fact. This is not some fantastic opinion of a particular speaker. This is so. This is what is actually going on. So one looks around seriously, wanting to be committed to some kind of action, not for a day or two or a month or a year or so, but committed continuously for the rest of one's life. Undeviated, not persuaded by demagogues or people who promise you heaven and so on, all that business, but few, perhaps many even, who are seriously concerned And not only to what the speaker is saying, but to listen. To one's own responses, to one's own fears, to listen, not only to the birds and to the ripple of water and see the beautiful landscape, but to listen so completely that there is no barrier between you and that which you are listening. The art of living is far greater than any other art. And we have never spent perhaps a day or two or a month or so to find out what's the art of living. There is an art of living. When I spent years and years to become a scientist, go to the monasteries and spend all your life there, or spend one's whole life earning a, a livelihood which is a vocation of imitation, To become a surgeon, a doctor, you spend 10 to 14 years. And we never learn or even spend a day to find out what's the art of living. And together, this morning, we're going to find out. 
Not that the speaker is going to point it out and therefore you agree or disagree. But together find out. And we are going to talk over together not only relationship between human beings, we are going to talk over together fear, whether there is an ending to fear. Talk over together all the movement of pleasure and whether there is an ending to sorrow. And also we are going to talk over together what is religion and what is meditation. And to find out if there is something most sacred which is untouched by thought something that's infinite. We're going to talk all these matters over together in these two talks, this morning and tomorrow morning. And merely talking about it has no value. One has written books and books and books. There have been thousand gurus which is the most silly form of profession. <laughs> there have been thousand priests, popes, every form of psychology, from the most ancient Sumerians to the present day, depending on your pleasure, you can choose any one of them. And in the Western world, there is only one entity, which becomes rather tiresome. <laughs> and we are going to talk all these matters over together. Please, the speaker means together, which means you have to exercise your own brain, not just go to sleep. We are not persuading you. We are not trying to tell you what to think or direct. We must. We can only think together when we have no motive, which is extraordinarily difficult because all of us have motive of some kind or other, which ultimately prevents a communication. There is not only a verbal communication, which is what was going on now, but also a communication non-verbal. which requires on the part of each one of us not only to hear the word, the content of the word, the meaning, the significance of the word, not only etymologically, but what the word conveys to each one of us, and whether the word distorts our perception. So one has to be extraordinarily aware if we are going to investigate together into all this. So please, if one may remind you again, this is not an entertainment of any kind. But you are used to being entertained. 
every evening on the television. That's their entertainment. Sit by the hour looking at the beastly thing. And we're being influenced, coerced, consciously and unconsciously. And to be aware of all this that's going on around us. Not to be shaped, not to be conditioned, which we are conditioned. And that conditioning is being more and more emphasized, given strength. We are Americans, American way of life. So do the English say, so do the French, Italians, the Russians. And the whole of East is imitating the West to be conscious of all this. Not as information, not as data accumulated, but as human beings. Can we? together this morning. So first let us look at ourselves because we are the result of thousands upon thousands of years Our brains have been evolving and our brains have extraordinary capacity as is shown what as is shown in the technological in the scientific world. Extraordinary things are happening. Destructive, diabolical and also great helping man to live better life and so on. And we'll never spend a day or even a few hours looking at ourselves actually as we are, not according to any psychologist, philosopher or any book or any expert. I don't know if you have not noticed what's happening in this country. There are so many specialists here. If you have a headache, you go to specialists. If you have sex problems, there are specialists. How to bring a child how to feed a child. Every you are being I don't know if you realize all this. That we are becoming slaves to specialists, experts. And so we are losing the real quality of freedom. So we're going to talk about together all this. Where shall we start? Knowing that you, as a human being, have created this society and you have losing your relationship with with nature. Where shall we begin? Something exotic, theoretical, problematical? Or shall we begin with the nearest thing that we have, which is you and another? You 
and your relationship with another. Shall we begin there? Or do you want to begin with God? God is the invention of man. We'll go into it when we talk about religion. So we must begin very near, to go very far. The, the very far is not in time. Time is a very complex process. The now, the now, the present, contains what we are now is the past. Past memories and so on. <coughs> Either <coughs> we begin very near, that is me, you, and observe not in terms of time, either chronological or psychological, but observe, be sensitive, be alive to the actual fact of what you are. Because for if we don't bring about a mutation at the, in the present, mutation psychologically, so that the very brain cells themselves are transformed, as brought about a deep change. If we don't do it now, the now being the whole of time, then the future is what we are now. I wonder if you understand, right? Are we seeing this together? Not agreeing. Do we see this fact? The tomorrow is the today. Either it's repetitive, going to the office every day from nine to five, or the factory and so on, laboring. And if there is no transmutation now, there will be again the same repetitive action tomorrow. So the future is what is now, I wonder, right? Do we see this fact together? We all want to become something, right? Either a successful businessman making lots of money, or begin to change ourselves into what we should be, the becoming. The becoming takes time. Right? And is there any becoming at all? There is becoming physically, externally, from a clerk to an executive, from an ordinary man into so-called saint, and so on. There is outwardly, there is a becoming. But inwardly, is there a becoming at all? So the becoming implies time. And this quality of time distorts our thinking. 
point of view for it. May I go on with it or, or is it all I'm talking, you're just listening? We are trying to find out together what is change? What is a mutation in the brain cells? Which is the biologists are going to all this. Does change, mutation demand time? So we are asking what is Seeing what we are, actually, that is, our consciousness, which is what we are, our consciousness, our consciousness is all the react biological and physiological re responses all our beliefs faith dogmas rituals and so on also all the network of fear Observe it for yourself, please. You're, the expert is not talking. I am not, the speaker is not an expert, thank God. But he, we have investigated a great deal into this matter for over 60 years. The speaker is not a learned person. Did not accumulate all this through books, but obs observing, listening. And we're asking, I am this. My consciousness is this. Fear, sorrow, pain, pleasure and all the varieties of fear, all the nationalistic, tribalistic responses, prejudices, black, white, purple, pink and all the rest of it. We are all that, subtle, violent, cruel, bitter, cynical, and we're always trying to change that to something else, like violence, trying to change violence into non-violence, which is to become. The becoming involves time. We are questioning very seriously into this whole meaning of time. If there is no time at all to, as tomorrow, or the next second, what is then change? You understand? Either that change is instantaneous or there is no change at all. That's what we're going to find out. We said we will start with relationship, which is man, woman, 
between human beings, whether they live here or far away in the Eastern world. What is a relationship? Relationship is the most important thing in life. It's a lot. And without relationship you cannot possibly live. The monk who goes off into a monastery, he's related. He specialises in one discipline that takes most of his life, all his thinking capacity, but also he's related to his wife or to his friend or to his girlfriend, so on. So what is our relationship? Are we related at all? How can there be a relationship with another if you are individualistic? Go into it, says. If you are thinking about yourself all the time, which you are, your success, your business, your worries, your problems. And she's also doing the same thing. Ambition, greed, individualistic pursuits, individualistic fulfilments. And this is what we call a relationship. Right? With pleasure, with encouragement, dependence, possessiveness, jealousy, anxiety, irritation, annoyance and all the rest of it that goes on in relationship. If one is aware of all this, which I doubt very much if one is aware, if one is really actually concerned to find out what is actual relationship, apart from this, this obviously is not relationship. You may sleep with somebody. and all the pleasure and pain of it. So, is relationship the building of images between you and another? You build an image about you, about another wife or girl or whatever it is. You have built an image. It may, the relationship may be one day or 10, 20, 30, 40 years. You have built gradually, day after day, day after day, an image about her and she about you. And these images have relationship with each other. But actually, there is no relationship. I wonder if you go, go into all this. We have to face all this. If we are going to discover for ourselves whether there is a possibility of deep mutation in the very brain cells themselves. This is what the biologists are asking. They are experimenting with all this. But if we do not discover things for ourselves, we depend on chemistry, on specialists, and therefore we become so utterly insensitive and superficial. So 
So is it possible to live with another? Please go into it with me. Thinking together, is it possible to live with another without a single image, picture, thought? Then only is there a relationship directly without any. Probably you never even asked that question. What is thinking? Why has thought predominated the world? And also in our relationship, how intimate it may be. What is thinking? Not thinking along a particular line or particular discipline. Thinking about something. We're not asking what is is it to think about something. But actually thinking per se. What is thinking? And thought has created the most extraordinary things in the world. All the great paintings, the great cathedrals, medicine, and all the destructive instruments of war. And thought has also brought about communication, rapid communication, surgery, and also all the things that are in temples, in churches, and mosques. Thought has put all that together, the rituals and so on. So one has to find out, not be instructed by another, or she becomes so silly at the end of it, so superficial, but to find out for oneself what is thinking. And why we have given such extraordinary importance to it. Thinking, surely, is the outcome of memory. There is no memory, there is no thinking. Memory is stored in the brain among yourselves. And Memory is knowledge. Memory is born from knowledge. If you have no memory, no knowledge, you have no memory. And knowledge is born from experience. Experience, knowledge, memory and thought are limited. Knowledge, future knowledge, or expands, knowledge expanding itself, is still limited. All knowledge, whether in the infinite future, is still limited. There is no complete knowledge about anything, can never be. It's because it's based on experience, collective, in, built gradually, step by step. So thought is limited. I think we all agree to that. Must, I mean, that's obvious. You are thinking about yourself all day, either meditating, you follow thinking, which is another form of thinking about yourself. I wonder if you realize all Thinking about yourself, your problems, your relationship and so on, that very thinking is being limited, must inevitably create conflict. 
anything that's limited is divisive. Are we thinking together or you say no it's not or thinking together, not agreeing together. So, thought in the and so that thought with its image, with its picture, <coughs> is the divis- divisive factor in relationship. This is logical. And being limited. It must inevitably create conflict between between the man, woman, child, so on. Geographically, you have divided the world, human beings, as Asia, Europe and America. Thought has divided human beings as Western. Eastern. Thought has divided people as Catholic, Protestant, Buddhist, Hindus, Tibetan, Shifal. Thought has been responsible for all this. And thought, which is born of knowledge, memory, has its place. Without thought, you cannot go back to your home. You cannot write a letter. If you're a good carpenter, you must be. You must have a great deal of knowledge about wood and the quality of the wood and the grain and so on. And has thought any place in relation to each other? Knowing very clearly, logically, sanely, that thought is limited and therefore divisive, separates you and me. And hence, everlasting conflict between you and another. So we are asking. If you are still awake and not going to sleep, we are asking whether thought, being limited, producing, inventing great many things which are beneficial for man, and also inventing terrible things to destroy man. What shall we do with thought? You understand the question? Please ask this of yourself. Don't wait, please, for the speaker to tell you. Seeing what thought has done, beneficial, helpful, and so on in one direction, extraordinary capacity of the brain in one direction, and also the extraordinary energy given to the destruction of man, different ideologies, the communist, socialist, the capitalist, so on, ideology. Spending enormous energy. Because all it is the it's the activity of thought, all this. So, what place has thought with regard to love? Is love 
one can only answer that question logically, sanely, when we understand whether thought has any relationship in relationship. You may recognize the woman or the man, but when thought takes over the relationship, then there is everlasting battle. Now, that has been the condition, the, the training, the law, uh, thousands of years, to live with conflict. We all live in conflict. Meditation is a form of conflict. To go to business, everything that you do either contradicts what you are or the very self is the contradiction. You understand all this? The me, the self, is put together by thought. The me is memory. The me you may invent is this super me or the extraordinary uh, ultimate me is still put together by thought. Thought, mem- the me is network or the bundle of memories. And so, Is love memory? Please go into it all for yourself. If it is not, then what will you do with all your memories that you have about her, about him, the insults, the pleasure, you know, all that business. What will you do? Just carry on day after day, day after day, till you die? What is the factor that will end thought in relationship, if you see that thought is detrimental, dangerous, destructive in relationship, because thought, being limited, must inevitably divide, separate. If you really see that, not as a verbal statement, but as an actual fact of life, everyday life, then you will inevitably ask, is it, what place has thought? Psychologically, has it any place at all? And if it has no place in relation psychologically, then what is love? Is love the factor, please listen, is love the factor that denies totally the separative element in relationship? Then one has to ask, if you are at all serious, committed to find out all these matters, if it is desire, as it is for most of the day, you see it on the television every day, in every book, 
desire and pleasure. Then what is love? Is it a matter to be cultivated? Is it something to be achieved? Give me time. I will learn how to love. I will go to college specialists and learn all about it. That's what you are doing in different ways. Somebody is going to tell you what it is. So we have to go into this question very, very deeply. Not superficially, just for the day and pass it by. Because that's what the biologists are seeking. A mutation in the brain cells. And the brain cells contain all memories, knowledge, experience. The brain cells are the whole content of my contra- your consciousness. And there must be mutation in that, which means the brain cells themselves bring about a mutation in themselves. Is that a matter of time? If it is a matter of time, as we have lived for 5400, whatever, the archaeologists say we are. No mutation has taken place at all. Given time. Time may be the enemy. You understand? Time may be the enemy of mutation. So I have to understand, is love desire? And what is desire? Not how to suppress desire or how to transmute desire or how to direct it along right channels or identify desire with some symbol so as to ennoble desire which all sounds rather nonsensical but you to understand what is desire to look at it, find out go into it What is desire? It's important to understand this, not verbally or theoretically, but actually, because we are driven by desire. We are s- desire becomes so extraordinarily dominant in our lives, has become. Desire to be president of desire to be something or other. You know, the whole worship of success in this country. I don't know if you have watched, no. America is becoming the symbol for the rest of the world. And so, this country is the example. And if you strip the, take away the superficial layers of an affluent society, you're like the rest of them, full of desire, contradictions, pain, conflict, uncertainty, and all the rest. So, 
We must go into this question if we have time. What is desire? We're going to quarter past twelve, so we'll go into quickly. You're still awake, I hope. What is desire? You understand? How strong it is in our life. Desire for enlightenment, desire for more knowledge, desire for power, status, riches, to re- desire to reach heaven. You know, desire that extraordinary energy. Desire to go to the moon, desire to invent the latest destructive bomb that will destroy the whole humanity. What relationship has desire? To love. Or no relationship at all. What is desire? Please bear in mind we're not suppressing, we're not saying it must be translated or changed into some other thing. We're examining the very movement, the birth of desire. We are not analyzing, we're observing. Analysis is different from observation. Analysis implies there is an analyzer and the thing being analyzed. In observation there is no analysis, just to observe how the thing is born. Are we clear on this matter? We are observing. There is, in observation, there is no observer. If there is an observer in observation, the observer then is directing. The observer then is the past, his memories, his idiosyncrasies, and so on. So the, as long as there is the observer as the past, exam, looking, then there is a distortion taking place. This complex, you'll, you'll understand it as go along. So, to observe without the observer, to observe without the me, the me being all the complex memories and so on. So, we are observing the nature and the and the structure and the birth birth the origin of desire <coughs> there is no desire without sensation sensation is born through visual perception, visual seeing, touching, and so on. The sensory responses create the sensation. Say a beautiful woman, man, clothes, whatever it is, cars, and so on. The seeing the contact, then the sensation, right? Seeing, touching, contact, sensation. Then what takes place? Then thought 
creates the image of that you are in that car or in that dress or in that shirt, right? At that moment, when thought, with its image, takes take controls or dominates sensation, at that second desire is more. Right? I wonder if you have understood this. One sees a beautiful shirt in a shirt being a man, I hope you don't mind. One sees a shirt in a, in a shop window, goes inside, touches it, says, oh, how nice that material is. How would it look on me? At that second desire begins. Right? Do you see this? Now the question then is, sensation is necessary, is obvious, is physical, if you are not, if you have no sensations, biologically physical sensations, you are paralyzed. There must be sensation. That's the whole physical organism exists on stimulation and sensation. But when thought takes, gives shape to sensation, at that second desire is born. Right? Is it clear? If it is clear, then we can ask the next question. Can there be a gap between sensation and thought taking shape of that sensation? Right? Take, giving it a shape to that sensation. Right? You are following this? So that there is, there is a, an interval between the sensation and thought, which is not discipline. <coughs> discipline implies, <coughs> oh Lord, this, the word this, discipline comes to the word disciple. Disciple, one who is learning. Learning to see whether there can be a gap between sensation and thought giving shape to sensation. Gap. And that gap extended. Do it, you will see the fun of it. And the seriousness of it. Because we are completely change the whole question of control. I won't go into it, it's no time now. We'll do it tomorrow. If there is time tomorrow. So, thought giving shape to sensation is the beginning, the origin of desire. And that origin, which is desire, has nothing whatsoever to do with love. Love is not born of thought. Therefore, love has its own intelligence. Thought has its own peculiar intelligence. But the intelligence of that Compassion, love, is something totally outside the brain, which is not contained within the limitation of thought. But to stop to now, nearly half past four. Oui, oui.
get up. Please. 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 May I most respectfully suggest don't clap. I don't know for whom you are clapping. Not for the speaker. If you are clapping for yourself, that's a different matter.